Hi everyone, it's David Thompson again with Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm joined today by Clay Risen, who is the editor of the New York Times Disunion blog. Clay, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you just start off by just telling us a little bit about the blog uh, broadly? Sure. So Disunion is a series that began with uh, the on the sesquicentennial of Lincoln's election and will follow the and has followed and will follow the course of the war uh, roughly chronologically, uh, pairing up articles that we run with uh, the 150th anniversary of various events uh, as they happen during the war. And each entry that we have is a standalone essay by anyone uh, from academia, from uh, journalism, the, the sort of lay historical community, if, if you will, uh, anybody who has something to say about a particular event or a particular trend or, or interesting story to tell about the Civil War that uh, is uh, in the aggregate try, uh, presenting uh, sort of our story about what, uh, what happened during the war. And obviously this is an online blog. Um, some decision making was involved uh, coming to ultimately settle on that. I was wondering uh, what ultimately made you guys at New York Times decide to go with this in the online wing versus, say, it being a print feature. Well, this is happening in a lot of different parts of the newspaper. We're starting to see the online world not as an adjunct to what goes into the newspaper, but really uh, a thing in itself and starting to see the possibilities that come from freeing us from uh, the need to shorten a piece to run in a, a space on the page and, and also to compete with other pieces for the page. We, we decided that while every once in a while we could run an article that's from Disunion in the print section, uh, we wanted the freedom, really, to be able to run a lot of articles, uh, several articles a week, uh, to do uh, online graphics features that you really couldn't do, uh, multimedia things uh, that you couldn't do in the print page, and really to kind of give ourselves over totally to exploring that digital space without having to think too much about what it would look like in a, a print edition. Now, I'm very curious, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers are as well, as to how you personally came across this gig. Uh, was it just something that merely came across your desk? Do you have a personal interest uh, in history? Uh, and if so, you know, has this kind of changed how you viewed the Civil War um, because of now your very intimate uh, knowledge of it, obviously, by dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Well, absolutely. Uh, for me, I'm uh, what you might, and I, a lot of my, a good number of my colleagues fall into this category. Sort of what you might, you know, a, a, a sort of lapsed academic uh, people who were pursuing uh, an academic career and then decided journalism was uh, the easy out. Maybe uh, our opportunities arose, life went one way. I was uh, all set to go into a history PhD and decided. Uh, to go into journalism instead. Uh, and so for me, this is a great opportunity because I get to go back to uh, this discipline that I love, that, that I really uh, still have a very strong uh, interest in. Uh, my interest before was in, uh, my academic interest was uh, modern German history, but American history is equally fascinating. And to be honest, I, I grew up in the South, I grew up in Nashville, uh, so I had sort of, uh, you know, it sort of absorbed the Civil War to some extent, but uh, a lot of this process has been incredibly eye-opening on a very basic level for me, uh, starting to really understand uh, not just, obviously, the course of the war, but so many of the different issues that are brought in to the war, be they uh, you know, advances in military technology and military strategy to uh, legal debates over slavery. I mean, the war really brings all of this together in a way that very few stories do. Uh, to answer your question about how I got involved, uh, it was something that just kind of came across my desk. Uh, it was uh, originated with a proposal by one of our early contributors, uh, Jamie Malinowski, uh, he wanted to do, he came to us with several ideas about following the course of the war, and we really liked that idea. We sort of gave it our spin, and uh, myself and a few of my colleagues uh, became, sort of formed a team uh, to uh, create and edit this series, and uh, everything else, so they say, has been history. Now, just from a practical standpoint, you certainly do have some individuals who are regular contributors, uh, especially early on, um, people like Adam Goodhart or Harold Holzer. Um, but I wonder, 
How do you go about now, uh, you know, is this a process of soliciting these types of reviews? Has it spread by word of mouth in these different communities that you're hoping to reach out to? So some of the work's being done for you. How do you go about that process? Yeah. It's, it's a mix of both. Uh, and that's really how it works in the op-ed page, which we're a function of. Uh, we have regular contributors. Uh, we have people who write for us on a, I'd say a semi-regular basis. And then there are topics where we need to go find somebody, particularly when it comes to, you know, say a battle or a particular event where uh, one of our more generalist writers, uh, we're very good at drilling down on uh, topics that are, you know, that are out there that are fairly well known, uh, will not necessarily have the expertise. Uh, you know, the, the real hardcore legal debate over the Emancipation Proclamation, let's say, that's somewhere that we'd want to go find a specialist to write about that. And so, so we do go do that still, although you're right, less and less do we need to do that because we have this stable of regular or semi-regular contributors from which we can draw and we can say, hey, Harold or, or you know, hey, Adam, we would like you to do, we know you know a lot about this topic. We'd love for you to write a piece about this. And, and people are great. I, we, I have never worked with a greater group of writers, uh, uh, everyone from the academic side to uh, writers that, or people who are not professional writers who came to us because they love the blog and they say, hey, I happen to know a lot about this one subject. Love to write for you. Uh, let's give it a go. And they're, they're a joy to work with. Now, part of the decision when you did decide on the blog obviously came down to format, and you t opted, and I would say understandably so, for a chronological approach. I wonder how you all settled on that. Were there other serious contenders, or was it pretty much from the outset you knew this was the direction you wanted to pursue? I'd say there wasn't too much consideration given to other formats. Uh, for us, it was something that we wanted... Well, let me say, really, there was a very practical decision. We didn't know how popular the series was going to be, so uh, we thought we'd never done anything like this. Uh, no one had ever really done anything like this on a high-profile level, so we thought, well, we need a way to cut it off. If this comes out and it bombs, we want to be able to say, after a few months, hey, that was always our plan, we're always going to end it. So we decided, well, a chronological format allows us to do that because we can start with Lincoln's election. And then at Fort Sumter, we can call it quits. And we can say, well, there we go, that five months or so, that was what we were always planning to do. Now, it didn't work that way. The blog, the series took off immediately and was incredibly popular. And at that point, we kept with it. But I think it was the right decision also from a... a from a strategic point of view, it's much easier to organize themes and to to tackle different topics uh, that might not fit within a chronological point of view within a chronological framework. So we tell stories that have date pegs, as it were, uh, battles or, or uh, decisions by Lincoln. Uh, but in between all of that, we can run articles that are about baseball in the camps or about life on the home front or things that really don't have a, a peg, so to speak, but don't feel weird when they're in between pieces that do have those pegs. Well, I, for one, am one of those people that are very happy that this thing has just skyrocketed and taken off. It's a joy to read every day. Uh, I wonder, you know, we're looking at a war that is now 150 years past, yet this is a very, very popular blog. Could you speculate at all as to, you know, what gravitates people still towards the war? You know, it was a risk that you all took, and it certainly has paid off. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I, I don't mean to, I, at the risk of descending into sort of these hoary, uh, uh, you know, phrasings about the war is uh, in the American Oracle, and although that it is, uh, I, I think that's true. I think that Every generation approaches the war differently. Uh, one thing that I was interested in, uh, certainly versus in comparison with how the war was approached by the country in, in 1960 at the, or in the, the 60s at the centennial, was that America looks much different today. We have, uh, we've seen an amazing, uh, you know, a real influx of immigrants and, and also a change in what it means to be American. And, and it's harder to say, well, the Civil War is... Uh, is a, is, means the same thing for everybody. And yet you see younger generations of people looking to the 
war as a way to understand what America was, what America is today. Uh, I think you also see audiences that you wouldn't have drawn earlier, uh, audiences, African American audiences, for example, or, or, uh, you know, uh, women who in the past might have seen the war as, you know, really a man's topic because that's how it was written. It was written as uh, a series of battles and a series of sort of celebrations of or, or, you know, tragic looks at, at the male enterprise. And today you tell the story in a much more multifaceted way. All of that's still there, but you also tell all these other stories that engage people and allow them to see themselves in that history. So I don't, so I am surprised, uh, to be honest, uh, with the size of the following. And yet, in some ways, it makes a lot of sense to me. Now, obviously, you've mentioned with chronological date to all of this, you know, kind of a natural ending, I suppose, once we get towards the spring of 2015. Uh, have you all thought about potentially extending this on into <laughs> reconstruction at all or, you know, alternatively, kind of other really seismic events in American history that you might take this model and perhaps apply it to? Well, we joke about it a lot. <laughs> and uh, I think there are some people who would love to see that happen. Uh, I myself and probably my wife and uh, family would not like to see that happen. We'll see. Uh, but, but yes, I think and it, whether it's something that we do exactly the same next time, uh, we talk sometimes about 2014 will be the centennial of World War I. Uh, maybe we don't take the exact same approach. But I think that we have a, a fairly robust model, uh, a fairly robust sort of proof of concept that you can take a historical event or a historical series of events, uh, a, one that happened over several years, and address it in a way that's systematic and and fairly regular, and do and bring readers in that people aren't going to be turned off by a historical topic by uh, a top, by a, an, a, a by a, an, a project that really drills down into known or unknown uh, parts of that topic. Uh, I think people really really uh, really uh, are attracted to that sort of thing. So I think I think there's no question that we'll do things like this in the future. I just can't say right now what exactly those will be. Well, I think that's obviously another discussion for another day for you folks. But for now, Clay, I really appreciate you taking some time out with us. Again, it's, it's Clay Risen, everybody, who's the editor of the Disunion blog, the New York Times. If you aren't following it already, I highly recommend you do so. They're great up on social media. I think I should mention that as well to keep you updated when new posts are coming up if you don't want to keep clicking refresh constantly. Um, but really great stuff. Uh, also worth mentioning that we here at Civil War Monitor are also going to be featuring some disunion posts, uh, forthcoming issues. So do keep an eye out on for that as well. We're grateful for this new partnership that we have with the Times and the Disunion blog. Uh, really excited about that moving forward. So again, Clay, thanks so much and, and keep up the great work. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really like what you guys are doing and I'm really glad to be working with you. It's, uh, it's a real joy.